It's my great pleasure to present our today's speaker, Professor Mark Lawrence from Nazarbayev University. And the title is Partially Holomorphic Functions and Several Variables. Well, thank you, Professor Lawrence, and please go ahead. Thank you. Okay, thank you for the invitation. Um, <clears throat> this is um, a talk about some research of mine, which was an attempt to uh, do something. I didn't quite succeed, but I think uh, the results are still interesting and not it's not conclusive. Um, the general topic's not very familiar, so I have some introductory remarks. So um, the idea of moment conditions in complex analysis is very familiar. Um, for instance, uh, Marrera conditions, where you just look at it in the plane, you have a collection of curves, closed curves in the plane, and you say, if a function uh, satisfies Marrera condition on this collection of curves, is uh, this enough to um, um, say that the function is holomorphic? Okay, so uh, some people here may know a result that says if you uh, talks about all circles of two radii, R1 and R2, at each point in the plane. And there's a condition on R1 and R2 that says when when uh, Marrera conditions on all these circles uh, is enough for uh, determining a function if a function is holomorphic. It has something to do with a Bessel function. Okay, So <clears throat> that's... Um, familiar to people in complex analysis and Fourier analysis. Uh, I'm talking about something different here, which is uh, uh, had a lot of research by a few people you know, working in several complex variables. And so this is what I, what's called the one dimensional extension property. So given a function in one or several variables, you're given a fixed collection of curves, each of which bounds an analytic disk. And you want to know when is holomorphic extension from the curves to the disks enough to say that, I, that your function is holomorphic or that it extends holomorphic to, to a domain if you're in CN, for instance, okay? And I don't know when, uh, this research started, the papers I know began, uh, appeared in um, um, uh, the 1970s, uh, Agronofsky and I think Eisenberg. Okay, and also, um, okay. Now, I'm writing examples that are relevant to what I'm uh, going to talk about, okay. The first example looks quite basic. It is very basic, but uh, it's a building block for interesting examples. Okay, we just look at um, concentric circles centered at the origin in the um, uh, complex plane. And uh, a function has the one dimensional extension property for this family if uh, it can be written as a function of R, continuous in R and holomorphic in Z, where it's holomorphic in Z. All right. So, for instance, you just take R times the power of Z, and that's an example. Right? <clears throat> Now, um, an ex example uh, that's been studied in um, for the ball in particular is um, you have a smooth, strictly convex domain containing the origin, and you say that for every every complex line through the origin, <clears throat> a function 
on the boundary extends holomorphically on the line, right? Again, not so interesting by itself. What people study is the question of, let's suppose I have a finite number of points and I have this condition for the lines through a finite number of points, can I determine that uh, a function is holomorphic, right? And the answer is uh, basically yes, with some exceptional examples. Right? And uh, again, Agronovsky was somebody who worked on this early. Uh, also Baracco, Luca Baracco in Italy does uh, work on, still works on this problem on the ball doing uh, special cases. Uh, I have a result in one paper about the stability of this problem, but. Uh, okay, and then uh, the third one is um, something I studied a lot. Um, so you have a smooth, strictly convex domain and uh, you have a continuous function on the boundary and it extends holomorphically from every vertical slice of the boundary to the slice of the domain, all right? Uh, as with the last example, this is just a, a, uh, the beginning of the story. You ask, what if you have extension from uh, horizontal and vertical slices? And that's, uh, that led, that question led to uh, some of this research, right? And um, I believe I'm the only one that has uh, results on this case, although the uh, the case of lines through several points has been uh, uh, studied by several people. Okay. Now, um, I think you already understand that the... Um, um, the idea of the one-dimensional extension property has been uh, determining a, a set of uh, um, one uh, curves, well, let's say a set of slices, uh, for instance, which are sufficient to determine a function is holomorphic. Uh, if you have holomorphic extension on all of those slices. Okay. Um, and there's an interplay. You can have a very general theorem as the first example I'm going to, to tell you about, or you can have a much stronger theorem and the stronger theorems will never be true in all cases. But um, Lee Stout around 1980 proved that if you have any domain with C1 boundary and you have, it doesn't have to be pseudo convex, no condition at all, except that it's a domain and you have a function, um, a continuous function on the boundary. And if for every single affine slice of the domain, uh, the function extends from the slice of the boundary to the slice of the domain, then the function extends holomorphically to D, right? So this is an ideal theorem in the, se in the sense of uh, having no exceptions and a very simple statement. Um, the proof actually uses uh, the Bachner-Martinelli kernel, as maybe somebody knows that you can write the Bachner-Martinelli kernel as an average of Cauchy uh, integrals over slices. And that was the technique here. And um, uh, in more recent years, Kitmanov uh, in Krasnoyarsk has still uh, worked with uh, studying the one-dimensional extension property and uh, using the um, um, Bachner-Martinelli kernel. Right. Now, 
Now, here's an example which was due to me. Um, original example with the uh, defining function as written here uh, in the 2000s and the uh, and ex generalization of this published in 2018. Okay. We take an ellipsoid, a special ellipsoid, which is a small perturbation of the sphere by, by a cross term, which is the real part of constant times the real part of Z times W, all right? And if you have an L1 function on the boundary, and if for almost every vertical and horizontal slice, the function extends holomorphically on the slices, then the function actually extends holomorphically to D. Now, this is as strong a theorem as you can get. Uh, obviously, if you just take the uh, vertical, the slices with Z equals constant, then any function of Z satisfies the condition of extending holomorphically in vertical directions, and those don't have to be uh, holomorphic. Right. Um, but then you add the second direction, and that's enough. Right? So I wrote suitable perturbation because uh, it's just easier to write than the um, um, exact condition, which I don't use. Basically, you uh, perturb by a power series with uh, geometric decay uh, in the terms, in the uh, homogeneous parts where you use anti-holomorphic degree to measure the, uh, the uh, degree of the homogeneous degrees. Right. Uh, but that doesn't have anything to directly to do with uh, what I'm talking about here. But uh, Now, um, the next one, it has quite a different appearance. Um, the reason I'm, I'm um, discussing, I'm mentioning this example, which is called the strip problem, uh, originally posed by Globevnik uh, around 1990 and solved by uh, Tumanov in uh, 2003. Um, you have um, just a horizontal strip in the plane, and you look at circles, uh, translates of the unit circle in this strip, and you say, what if a function is continuous on the closed strip and on every circle extends holomorphically to um, the disk inside. The question Globevnik posed was, does, does this mean that the function is holomorphic? Okay. And the answer, which Tamanov proved, was um, yes. Right. Um, amazing thing about this theorem is uh, about 15 years ago, I met Peter Lax, and um, um, he didn't know me, and he didn't know anything about my research. And but he said that one of the most interesting things he'd seen in complex analysis was Tumanov's theorem, and that motivated me to try to uh, improve Tumanov's theorem. I did improvements in regularity. Uh, where you can use um, uh, weighted LP spaces and also somewhat more general curves, uh, perturbations of ellipses. Uh, and uh, there's a completely different approach due to uh, Agronovsky for real analytic functions uh, and real analytic curve families, which uh, 
uh, actually, I don't understand very well, but it has the it doesn't have anything to do with uh, the methods that Timon have used, and my methods were quite similar. Now, the reason uh, the importance of this um, example is that in trying to improve it, I came up with a surprising result answering a question which, um, as far as I know, nobody had ever considered before. And that is, can moment conditions force a function to be real analytic without being holomorphic? All right. And the answer is yes. I have uh, several um, constructions all related. Uh, where I answered this. And um, so uh, I've done a little bit of on this over the last several years. And um, I don't have a um, complete understanding of the question or, uh, you know, when you can get a positive answer. And uh, what I was trying to do was prove this theorem for a um, a class of functions on the ball related to the one-dimensional extension property. Excuse me. So the main example I have is surprisingly, to my mind, surprisingly simple and direct in the sense that, uh, well, the conditions don't look so strange in the and you can write explicit functions which satisfy this, uh, which are in this class. Okay. So I take a discrete set in the plane, um, and then I suppose that the one dimensional extension property holds for every um, point in the set and every circle centered at that point. Uh, of any positive radius. Right? Surprisingly, no matter, even for an infinite discrete set, you'll never force a function to be holomorphic. Okay? What I pr proved was that, well, I write if the x is sufficiently spread out at infinity, then f is real analytic with infinite radius of convergence for the power series. And I'll write, I have an explicit example below. So I say specific, sufficiently spread out at infinity means basically um, you have uh, sequences of points going in three different directions. That's enough. You get, you get vertices of large uh, triangles. And um, my example is if I let x be the integers and then uh, rotate by uh, multiplication by a cube root of one, non-trivial cube root of one, and the square of that, I get uh, a very simple set of points, and the um, the theorem is true for this set of points, and it's uh, some more work. By the way, uh, Slutkovsky, um, Zbigniew Slutkovsky at uh, University of Illinois Chicago uh, helped made this observation about the power series, but all of these functions can be expressed as power series in Z, and then Z bar times G of Z to the N, where G of Z, uh, I've written the for explicit formula. G of Z in general is just an entire function which vanishes to first order at every uh, point of the discrete set, all right? So it's, an for me, uh, I like this example, but it's, uh, I don't know if it's optimal. For instance, I, I think it's possible that it, if you just take the integers 
and use the function g of z equals sine of z, this would be sufficient. All right. So um, this theorem, uh, there's two theorems which are closely related. One is more recent. This theorem really is about Fréché spaces because what we're saying is that this set of power series is closed under uniform convergence on compacta, just like holomorphic power series are uh, closed under um, uh, under uniform convergence on compacta. Entire functions, right? So this is uh, some generalization of entire functions. Right? Uh, now, more recently, I showed uh, with just a refinement of the same techniques that I can make what I call real analytic Bergman spaces. So let's say I take the Gaussian weight, which is uh, commonly used to define a Bergman space. And I take the functions, I take the power series, which define L2 functions in this, uh, with this weight, then uh, this class is closed under in L2 and there's bounded point evaluation. And um, bounded point evaluation is a uh, fundamental characteristic of Bergman spaces. And that's why I call these real analytic Bergman spaces. So, uh, I have been curious, uh, you know, what other examples of this sort could be constructed? Okay. And there's two directions. One is finding uh, cases in several variables where perhaps similar techniques can give me something uh, which I haven't already found. And then, as I mentioned already, I don't know, I don't believe I've gotten the optimal results in terms of uh, uh, the smallest size of the discrete set X, all right? Okay. Now, let's go back to this question about um, determining if a function is holomorphic by looking at, um, Um, for holomorphic extensions on horizontal and vertical slices. Okay. You notice the original example I wrote was not the ball. And in fact, the theorem fails for the ball um, very simply if you take uh, a function which is mod z squared, which is also equal to 1 minus mod w squared, this is constant on all horizontal and vertical um, slices of the sphere and therefore has holomorphic extensions from all of those slices. However, it does not have a holomorphic extension. It's not what we call a CR function. All right. um, a long time ago, I characterized uh, such functions which extend in two directions. And let's just take the class of all functions in L2 of the sphere, which extend holomorphically uh, to this on horizontal and vertical slices. Okay. Uh, I write this in L2, uh, so that's just for convenience because it's natural. But uh, this class of uh, functions is actually the closure in L2 of polynomials in Z, W, and mod Z squared. Okay. All you need for this third uh, entry is some function depending on mod Z squared, which, which separates points, separates uh, the different values of mod Z. Right. So you could use mod Z, that would be also. Now, uh, 
there is there is an extra property which occurs with um, these functions, right? And let's say I have a, a particular polynomial in z, w, and mod z squared, all right? If I use exactly the same polynomial, I get a function on the ball, which is uh, holomorphic in W. The function which is holomorphic, the extension which is holomorphic in Z is simply gotten by replacing uh, mod Z squared by one minus mod W squared inside the ball. Right, so they both have the same boundary values. Now, uh, let's look at this function, uh, this polynomial P of Z, W mod Z squared. It's holomorphic in W by construction, but what happens on the horizontal slices where W is constant? Well, this factor z squared is not so bad. This is like my very first example using concentric circles. So in fact, um, this function has from ev on every horizontal slice, w equals constant, it has a holomorphic extension from every circle mod z equals r, every, as long as you're contained in the ball. And vice versa, if you take the other polynomial, it, it's holomorphic in z, has holomorphic extensions from every circle where mod w is equal to r on the vertical slices. Now this I like, given uh, the kind of things I've been doing, because uh, my, Theorem in the plane used uh, lots one-dimensional extension properties on lots of um, concentric circles. So this uh, leads to a starting point for some investigation. All right, and uh, to see what is okay. Now here is the definition. Uh, it's a class of functions which includes the one above and, and uh, can be more general. Um, it's of interest to people who study the one-dimensional extension property, but um, I'm not sure. I don't know any application yet, all right? But I say its function is partially holomorphic. If it's holomorphic on slices in one affine direction, and satisfies moment conditions for holomorphicity on all slices in one or more other affine directions. Right? So that's exactly what happens uh, in this example above on the ball. Yeah. Now, uh, the, the um, interesting examples are rare. What do I mean by interesting examples? Interesting examples would be if you get some functions like this and they're not actually holomorphic. So let me um, show you a little example. If I have a convex domain and um, let's suppose a function is holomorphic in Z and then uh, it's um, holomorphic, it, it satisfies a one-dimensional extension property on vertical slices, which are given by um, sub-level sets of my defining function intersected with slices. Right. It, this is exactly what happens in my example on the ball. All right. Um, Now, uh, to show you uh, what happens in, in, with the case I already know, with this uh, row where I know that slicing is sufficient to determine if a function is holomorphic, then if uh, a function extends holomorphically on z slices 
uh, sorry, if it's already holomorphic in Z, and then uh, it extends um, um, holomorphically on these uh, curves in the vertical slices, then in fact, um, I can apply the uh, theorem about slicing and say that this function for every subdomain given by uh, row less than t, uh, then uh, on the boundary, uh, it extends the um, It <clears throat> extends holomorphically, <clears throat> and so you get the <clears throat> which must be must be the original function, and so the function has to be holomorphic. So, um, <clears throat> right. so there probably aren't very many interesting examples of this partially holomorphic uh, functions, but uh, now. <clears throat> I already showed you that uh, the standard coordinates, uh, uh, just the z and w directions, are not enough to determine if a, a holomorphic extension of a function. But in fact, no finite number of directions is sufficient to determine holomorphic extension from the sphere to the ball. So the ball is, is extremely special that way. All right. <clears throat> So if I have a finite number of distinct ortho orthogonal coordinate systems in C2, then I can just write down a function which extends holomorphically from S on every slice, uh, vertical and ho or horizontal, in each of these coordinate systems. All right. <laughs> It's quite easy to prove. It, it, what you do with the z squared is, um, for instance, you write that in the zi, wi coordinates, and the zi and wi will cancel out any um, anti holomorphic ter terms and give you um, mod zi squared and mod wi squared. So. Um, <clears throat> so um this function has an extra property well it's actually uh easily uh, verified by direct inspection that um on every slice where it's not already holomorphic in one of these coordinate systems, then uh, the function extends from, uh, holomorphically from circles which are centered, uh, concentric circles in those slices, all right? So I get functions which have uh, are not holomorphic. These are defined on the domain now, but they satisfy a huge number of uh, one-dimensional extension condition properties and using concentric circles. So I wanted to know if this would be another example where I could prove real analyticity. Now I can do something, but uh, so the first thing is I have, this is an observation about a specific function. Okay, and then the general theorem is uh, if I have a continuous function which extends on all affine slices in all of these coordinate, finite number of coordinate directions, let's look at the function, the extension which is holomorphic in Z. Then it's partially holomorphic in, in with respect to all of the other coordinate directions using concentral, concentric circles, all right. all right. And, uh, well, this is the question which I already posed to you, right? 
Um, the proof, now I have a proof using residue calculations. I haven't written it out completely, but to the ingredients of this are pretty elementary. First of all, in any orthonormal coordinate system, the standard volume measure D on the sphere can be written as dz over z wedge dw wedge dw bar, all right? Now, I set up a residue, which is obviously zero, uh, because if I integrate with respect to z first, um, uh, I get zero on all of those slices. And then uh, one of these is supposed to, yeah, this is zi to the n plus one and, and then times z to the k. So I'm using two different coordinate systems here. Now I um, rewrite the integral using fact number one and I get almost the same integral, but notice that I'm using the dzi, which dwi, which dwi bar. And uh, I get zi to the n and z to the k plus one. Yeah. Now in these coordinates, I take residues and I get something on this slice, on this disk, which is w equals a, and by some, uh, some algebra and induction, I'm able to prove the theorem, okay? Um, this is probably, it's not very difficult, but it's probably not necessary to do this. Let's look back. Um, I have these special functions which are kind of monomials, which I know um, satisfy the um, um, extension condition. If I could show that polynomials in these guys were dense in the functions with all the extensions, with the ex desired extensions, then I could, uh, uh, I would have a proof, a more direct proof. And uh, all right. now, um, <clears throat> all of this is basically residue calculus and well, <clears throat> writing down some theorems, <clears throat> which I haven't proved. <clears throat> now, in order to uh, prove real analyticity, I copy the strategy which I used in the plane where I had many concentric circle families. And this involves ingredients, which uh, the way I'm writing them are probably not familiar, although uh, one part of this should be sort of familiar, okay? Well, the first thing is a very basic observation. If I have a function on, on a torus, mod z equals x, mod s mod w equals t, and if it has holomorphic extensions on the horizontal and vertical slices, then it has a fully holomorphic extension to the by disk. Now, this is a very easy result, just uh, examining the Fourier co coefficients. And um, uh, but this tells me that my function f of zw, which is my z holomorphic extension of the function satisfying all these uh, moment conditions. It has a holomorphic extension to every by disk, um, which is contained inside the ball, okay? So in the plane I did, uh, I had circles and I had holomorphic extension from circles. And so this is analogous, right? Now, uh, the next, tool I need is uh, what's called CR wedge extension. Okay. Let's suppose I have two half planes, all right? They're given by imaginary Z equals zero and imaginary W greater than or equal to zero. And then the other, I reverse the role of Z and W. If I have a continuous function on the union, which is holomorphic on the complex lines, uh, which are contained in these half spaces. 
Then it extends holomorphically to imaginary part of Z bigger than zero, imaginary part of Z bigger than W bigger than zero. <clears throat> now this is quite an old theorem. Basically, uh, uh, the um, these kind of theorems start with Bogolyubov's uh, edge of the wedge theorem in the late 1950s. The CR cases um, are, uh, this particular case is very simple and was proved in the 1970s. <clears throat> More general uh, versions were proved by Ira Petron, Petian and Hankin in the early 1980s. Right? <laughs> Now I write down this case in C2, which is uh, relatively easy to uh, describe. And um, I mean, the idea that you have two hypersurfaces, two half planes, and you have an analytic continuation in between them, that's easy to visualize. In fact, I want something which is uh, in C4, where I have two, six-dimensional uh, half planes of the same sort, uh, and they're foliated by two-dimensional uh, complex uh, subspaces. So uh, what's true there, even though these are thinner, right, six dimensions in, in real eight dimensions, it's enough to get um, analytic extension to uh, a full uh, eight dimensional uh, region, all right? So these, this is not very easy to visualize, although it's actually not at all difficult to prove, right? In this particular case. Now the last tool, the next tool, this is, um, complexification is a very general, uh, tool, but as applied to the one-dimensional extension property, it was uh, Globevnik and um, Agronovsky around 2000 who used this in uh, a few papers and showed the utility. Okay. So the idea is that by complexification, we can lift different holomorphic extensions up into higher dimensions so that they're distinct functions, all right? So complexification, it's just, um, we create new variables, uh, zeta i and tau i, and C2 is lifted into this, uh, C4 by letting zeta i equals uh, z i bar and uh, tau i equal w i bar, all right? And this means that um, mod z i, that the circle, the tori, mod z i squared equals w squared mod w i squared equals t squared uh, become, can be written holomorphically, all right? And um, we can lift the extension from the torus to a two-dimensional analytic variety defined by zeta i equals s squared over z i, tau i equals uh, t squared over w i. Right? And note for s and t, dis for distinct values of s and t, you get different uh, um, different varieties. So you really separated out the analytic extension side. Now it's easy to see that um, these varieties uh, are contained in um, the set where imaginary part of zi, zeta i equals zero and imaginary wi tau ti equals zero. Um, so this is very like the uh, uh, extension situation I told you about in C2. And um, 
<clears throat> if I have two different coordinate systems given by I and J, then I get some analytic continuation in a full wedge, which is uh, attached to the uh, complexification of C2. Right? And I was hopeful and optimistic that uh, this would be enough. Where's my remark? Um, Okay, so I get, I started with this function, which has all these uh, one dimensional extension property. Um, and then uh, I lift it to a function on a four dimensional manifold in C4 and on wedges attached to that uh, manifold, I get, a uh, holomorphic extension in a full uh, open set. Now, I didn't explain how you get real analyticity, all right? If you have enough coordinate, if your coordinates uh, uh, systems and your analytic holomorphic extension can get you a full neighborhood of the complexification, well, then you have a function which is holomorphic in Z, W, uh, Z bar, and W bar, which is the definition of real analytic, all right? So that did work in the plane with my case of uh, concentric circles. However, it turned out there were limits on the directions I could get. Uh, I could only get directions where, uh, a certain uh, uh, quadratic uh, has imagine positive imaginary part, and that's not enough. All right. Now, I wouldn't say this means I was that these functions are not real analytic. I I just don't know. But uh, still, that's a lot of analytic continuation, and uh, it could be useful. All right. Now, uh, some other questions. Uh, if you look at a function like this capital F of ZW, uh, what about non-tangential boundary values? Uh, you obviously have non-tangential boundary values in the slices where it's holomorphic. Can you extend that into some uh, region which is a little thicker? I don't know. I haven't. I, I think it's possible. I didn't answer it yet. <laughs> More generally, um, these function spaces determined by lots of analytic continuation are an approximate the uh, holomorphic functions on the ball. And is there some interesting analysis you could do that way? I don't know. And I leave uh, one question, which is um, um, intrigues me. I showed you a theorem in the plane involving an infinite discrete set. Okay. But um, if you have a uh, just two points and you look at a function which is has holomorphic extensions from all concentric circles con uh, centered at these two points, is that enough? Do, could such a function not be real analytic? Um, I, do, I don't know. I think, in fact, they have to be real analytic, but I just don't have the right uh, idea for proving, but it's a, it's a difficult question, right? So that's, uh, that's what I have to tell you. I hope you found this interesting. I, I imagine you found this uh, new. I, I'm the only one doing these, these kind of, uh, studying these spaces of uh, special, spaces of real analytic functions. Thank you. Well, thank you very much uh, for a very nice lecture. And we have time for questions. So if any question, please just raise your hand. Let me know. Maybe meanwhile, I'll have small question. OK. Uh, you see, assume that we have a function of two variables 
Yes. And which is holomorphic, say, in a second variable. Yes. But it's measurable in first variable in general. Yes. Since it's holomorphic in second variable, you fix the first variable and you expand in Taylor series. Yes. Uh -huh. For a fixed first variable, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. So you have coefficients dependent on the first variable. Mm -hmm. uh, do you know maybe conditions for this function applying to the first variable to be from L1 space or some other space such that this expansion will be like uniform in first variable? Uh... I don't know anything that wouldn't be, I couldn't say anything that wouldn't be obvious. I don't know. Yeah, neither do I never saw this. But now we are actually working on uh, one question of um, some integral with uh, variable parameter, and we need this actually coefficients. We need to know where whether or not we can um, state that this series convergent uniformly in the first variable, which is not holomorphic variable. Okay. I see, yeah. Maybe you see, maybe I'll, uh, when we finish this article, we'll, we'll send you just, may you have some advices for us, right? Oh yeah, sure. Because it's exactly we're thinking about this holomorphicity in one variable and something else in another variable. Ah, uh, yeah, no, that's uh, interesting to me in general, yeah. yeah. Okay. So maybe more questions. ask just uh, um, yeah. sorry, uh, a general question um, yes in in clifford analysis there is a concept uh, they call them um, the slice monogenic functions is there any relation with uh, <coughs> the problems you consider you know unfortunately um I do know what Clifford algebras are, but I don't know anything. I assume Clifford, that this is something uh, on Clifford algebras, is that correct? Yes, These functions, yeah. Yes. Uh, Fun but functions, I don't know anything. Yes, yes. And I believe I missed a talk on Bergman kernels on uh, Clifford algebras a week or so ago, which looked interesting. Uh, was that your talk? No, no, you don't. No, okay. Yeah, but... Uh, uh uh what is this uh let me what is the term you are saying Mo they call them slice monogenic functions okay in Clifford analysis ah uh, i don't know by the way um i'm i have wondered if there are theorems of this uh real analyticity type which don't lie strictly in the uh, holomorphic setting there's no reason it should have to and uh, i mean clifford analysis could be a place for that or maybe some kind of lee groups but uh i don't know okay thank you okay thank you thank, you. thank you so maybe more questions Okay, well, if no more questions, then let us thank speaker for a very nice presentation. Thank you very much, Professor Lawrence. You're welcome, thank my you, pleasure. Thank you, Professor Lawrence, for agreeing to deliver a talk at our seminar. It was our pleasure. Yes. And hopefully I'm sorry we'll... I won't see you in a couple of weeks, but you will get this paper from me. <laughs>